Hi, my name is Kevin McDonald, and I'm declaring my independence. Independence from what? Why, negative thoughts and energy, of course. Chief among them, hate, division, and fear. You see, I know that we're all one, and together we can solve any problem, save our planet and each other. Please, join me as we come together as one and choose a better way to be. So now, let's begin with my independence report. And welcome, everybody, to my independence report. It's Thursday, and what that means is that uh, MTS Management Group and I have got together, and we are booking some of the finest acts from around the world in a musical venue, and we're calling it um, Musical Thursdays here on uh, my independence report. And Michael Stover, who is um, kind of the head bottle washer over there, has sent me a bunch of folks who have some really cool work that they're doing, and one of which is Tom Tika. Is Tika right? Did I say that right? Tika, yeah, that, you say it right, man. Yeah, that's, that's the way it's right. <laughs> Tom Tika, and he is. It's uh, let's see, it's one o'clock in the afternoon here in Seattle, and he's in Finland, I believe. And yeah, it's, it's not one o'clock. It's it's no, it's late at night there. PM, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and we have the we have the midsummer festivities here. So uh, I haven't touched the bottle yet. <laughs> I had to do this, <laughs> right? I am. I'm sorry if I kept you from from enjoying it. No, no, but that's but that's that's cool. And uh, so when you talk about Midsummer Festival and festivities, what are you talking about? What do they do there? Well, I mean, it's Northern Europe. It's like a carnival type of thing. People, uh, well, you know, in in lack of a better phrase, people get loaded, dance all night. And and I'll get loaded some more. Listen to music. It, we were just my wife and I were. We went for a stroll, and it just it was an apartment complex. And one of the balconies had a boombox. There they had the the resident had a boombox that was just blasting. You know, we were just wondering if there's old folks living next door. You know, well, how they must be feeling. Apparently, he didn't but, care. <laughs> no, no, he no. wanted his rock and roll. Right? Is it is it light all year round this time of year, or does it get dark for? Well, it it's light basically. Yeah. The sun doesn't really go down at all this time of year. You, I mean, it, it it's not actually light, but it's not really dark either. So it's like you get dusk at it's best. Like twilight. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's cool. Well, let's talk about you and your music. You have a brand new song, which we're going to premiere here. It's only been out like a week, and we're going to premiere here in a couple of minutes. And that's and that is um, called the Hearts of Fire. And it's off an album that you are. First of all, I know that you've been playing since you were six years old, and you have a tremendous passion for music. Um, how did you learn? Did, did learning all the instruments that you play on this album just come naturally to you, or did you have to work at it? And well, I kind of picked them up along the way. You know, it's you know, I started with the guitar when I was six and started singing, started writing songs, and and that's what I did for a very long time. That was my role in 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 all the groups that I was always, well, that I was in, um, guitarist, songwriter, singer. Um, <clears throat> but uh, then you know, when you have bands and you want the drum certain way, you need to show the drummer what to play, or you know, if you're big headed like me. You, walk behind the drum set it's like you know your playing is getting getting away a bit here you know <laughs> just to play a little bit less or play a little bit more here which is what i was always a bit of a con control control freak you know it's um didn't mean anything bad by it but just always had a very strong vision what the drum should be what the bass should be and so little by little showing you know what i wanted when i started doing that i wasn't really a great bass player or a drummer i'm still not a great bass player or a drummer but i always always sort of uh say that i can play kick ass drum tracks and bass track and that's different all if there's if there are any drummers listening right now they know the difference if you put me on stage and and you know gave me a drum set and you'd say that play I'd be able to do that appropriate a couple of songs and I'd be just out of breath. And if they, if they'd be too fast, it'd be embarrassing, you know, but, but in the studio, you can do a lot of things. You can slow down the tape a little bit, you know, if it's too fast for your skills. And, and um, so that's what I do. I know what they're supposed to be sounding like. So my, my goal in the studio is sort of 
edit and edit until because I know what a what a great drum track sounds like, but you know, for me to be able to produce that, it's, it's requires a slightly more effort than if 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 I was actually a drummer. So when I say I play all the instruments on the album, I want to be fair to all the people who are actually uh, uh, superb at what they're doing behind the behind the drum set or playing bass. Um, I I have countless retakes, but you know, I like to think that uh, I have good taste. So once I once I once I get a track that sounds like what I have in my head, it might be a composite of thirty bass tracks. But in the end, you only hear one, right? <laughs> so, well, so. don't you have to be in order to be a really good singer or songwriter? Don't you have to be a bit of a control freak because you know in your head what you're looking for? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, it it comes with the territory a bit, um, <clears throat> and that's. And obviously, um, when you start recording and 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 your records end up, uh, they you 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 know people start playing them on the radio, <clears throat> and um, it gets a little bit more serious, you know. As I remember with my with my group Carmen Gray when 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 the group got signed with Sony Music, because um, you're always looking for that single to get on, get on you know uh, mainstream radio, and and so once you enter that phase of your career where you actually start practicing writing songs that are both quality songs but have the hooks that you need um that's when you become a bit of a control freak because you, you you learn to appreciate the melody and you learn to appreciate the vocals especially because you know those be mixed where they are you know basically the loudest or, or, or the thing that that's most audible has to be because that's the melody and 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 you become a bit of a control freak as to what the other instruments are doing. So if the drummer plays too too much, then you you know ask him to play a little bit less, and and you know and and so that's the control freak. That's where the songwriters need for control. I think lots of times comes from this idea that you know we, I want the audience to hear the melody here. I want them to be able to you know hear the lyrics and what's happening right now <laughs> is getting in the way of that and so uh, i doubt that anybody ever really means anything anything nasty um when they get into you know it's it's a dangerous territory to to enter but when you enter that territory you don't really enter it where you say i'm going to teach you how to play it's it's more like i want i want control over my song but you know this leads to problems as you can imagine well, everybody's got uh, you can't be in your line of work without having an ego. And so everybody has got a bit of an ego about how they play. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, obviously. I mean, you don't I mean, if you don't have if you don't if you don't have a bit of an ego, you're not really going to amount to anything, are you? Because I, I people always ask, you know, when when you know, when I was they asked me questions about when I was in my late teens or early 20s that if I thought, you know, I was very good. Now I know when I listen back to the the albums of you know from that era and, and that you know they're not as good as i want them to be i was very i was a very young dude lots of room for improvement but at the time you have to think that you're the best in the world otherwise you're not going to get up on stage and go in front of you know a thousand people because if, if you think that you know i've got a lot of room for improvement i'm not really doing this right who's going to walk you know it, nobody's going to perform feeling that so I think that regardless of where you are, talent-wise or experience-wise, you always have to sort of be a little bit full of yourself to be able to give it your best, and if you that, know what I mean. Oh, absolutely. And now that group that you were part of, which is Carmen? Carmen um, Gray, yeah. Carmen Gray. Now, they had three albums and an EP, yeah. and, and they actually got a lot of airplay, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. It was wonderful, actually. You know, I guess I, one of the things that I miss from those times is that going on the bus and hearing your song on the radio because they were they were playing those tracks a lot and um and and that was very special you hop on a bus and well you know there's gates of loneliness and um that never gets old by the way never I, ever I it, it's 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 inc it's an incredible feeling and as a, as a matter of fact, I remember this one time when I was, I went to uh, buy an acoustic guitar for my son, my eldest son, and um, I was playing one of the riffs to test out the guitar in in, in the store, 
and that I play on one of the albums. And and the and the guy who was selling the guitars came to me. And I said that oh, I know that's a good song. It was written by me, you know. But it doesn't. That's not how you play the riff. It's, here's how you play. And and I'm like, <laughs> no, you don't. Was, I wrote that, you know. And he just started laughing. He didn't believe me. Right. And I didn't know who I was. And then I went to pay for the guitar and he saw the, my name on a credit card. You know, I was like, my God, you actually wrote it. And I said, it doesn't matter because it actually sounded better the way you did. <laughs> you know? But, you know, it's like, don't tell anyone, you know, because they're going to kick me out of the band. And so, <laughs> well, so, yeah. you were in your band, the, that band with your brother, weren't you? Weren't you co writing That was, yeah, that was, that was, yeah. Was, and, and I would actually present it as my brother's band because that's what it was. I kind of swam into it for many reasons, which I don't want to get into here. But yeah, first and foremost, uh, that was my, my baby brother's band, who's, who's um, also an enormous talent and, um, well, one of the best guys I know, obviously. And um, but what a, what a treat it was to experience it all with your brother, write all these songs, and because uh, we did that for about a decade. And I, I think when we stopped writing together, um, it, it was time. I think it was getting a little bit where you know the competition as to who's going to get the next single was getting a little bit too, you know, and and. Um, I believe he got one more ultimately than I did. So, um, but uh, but it was it was getting a little bit, you know, kind of, you know, it, it's like a, we love each other. We always have, always will. But it it's it, you can't divorce your brother, and you know this, right? Your brother's your brother. Even even if you have a blood transfusion, you're still going to be your brother tomorrow, all right? It, it, that's what we always. Yeah, that's what we always threaten each other. It's like, I'm going to have a blood transfusion tomorrow, <laughs> you know. It but, was a friendly but, rivalry. It was a friendly rivalry, but it was also a rivalry where it sort of started to eat us up a bit. So I think that we finished, it was three albums and one EP, and we finished exactly at the right time. I think it would have gone crazy had we not. And then there were like three years when we didn't really collaborate, <laughs> which tells you. A lot, I think it's enough said. But I mean, one of the good things is that we do write occasionally, you know, I, um, and uh, together. And as a matter of fact, on the new album that's going to come out in the fall, there's there's a song written by my brother and I, and which was sort of a it's 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 it, it's nice to do these little reunions. And on EP that I released in January, there's one that, that was written by my brother and I. And you know, whenever we do come together, the old magic's there. It 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 hasn't really gone anywhere, but I think it's the same thing as you know when 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 you work too closely with somebody for too long, um, and you spend too much time with them, even if they're the best guy in the whole world, which he is, you you know it it you get on each other's nerves, and obviously when you're young, and when you're stupid, and we you know there was a moment when we both were you know we drank a bit too much. And so I, I think, you know, being a little bit toasted continuously <laughs> and, and you know, looking looking at each other where like, you know, I just, you know, it, it get a little bit crazy like that, that, you know, paranoia sets in and, you know, and so, so I think that um, right now we get on like house on fire, you know, and like we always had. We have kids now, we married, have, you know, we're grown ups, right? But at right. the time, you know, but there's there's so many great memories, you know, regardless. I, I those were wonderful years and, and um wish wish I could relive them, but in a way whenever I see him I do. So, you know. He Yeah. 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 And you're and you're moving you're moving to a new direction. You've got uh, this uh, it, the song that you just released, uh, which is called uh, "Hearts on Fire," which we're going to play in just a second. Uh, and I understand we talked a little bit before the show that it's on Spotify. It's doing very well. It's starting to get some airplay in the United States and other places. So uh, on FM stations. So that's 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 really cool. Can you tell us a little bit about the song uh, and uh, what 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 what'd you write it about? Well, you know, when, when when you're very young, we I remember there's there was a group of guys. I was one of them, and and when people are young, they always think in terms of we're never going to be like our parents. Yeah, right. you know, it's it's kind of like we're, we're different. You know, we're going to set the world on fire, and our parents are boring, 
and we will never be boring. You know, it's almost like swearing that, you know, m my dad, my, my dad lost his hair. I'm never going to lose my hair. Well, you know, look at this. And so, so, so the thing is, um, the songs about that, I, I met with an old friend and, uh, we were, uh, we we're having lunch actually. And this was, uh, last fall before Halloween. Yeah. And we were just, you know, remembering all the friend, all the people that we went to high school with and, and he was in touch with some of the gang. I was in touch with the people he wasn't in touch with. And, and so we were just kind of like, you know, telling, filling, filling each other in as to what was happening in these folks' lives, you know, and, and we came to the conclusion that everybody's their dad, everybody, you know, just like, you know, it's, it's, we were laughing because, because he was the one who first said, you know, he met Steve, you know, it's just like his dad. Do you remember what his dad looked like? And I'm like, oh my God, I do. I remember he's just like his dad. And so that the song came basically from that. And that's why it's got a list of my friends and um their names you know matt's in therapy and St steve's married and ken hates his wife and steve married money ken hates his wife and art's in jail and um and and so it's it's list it's a list of that art doesn't exist i wouldn't put anybody's name there who's actually gone to jail but i um uh, but uh, well, art exists, but uh, but sadly, he's one of the folks that I was very close with who passed away. So he was a, it was a safe name to put in there. But um, he never went to jail. He was a stand-up guy. But um, but you know, I do know somebody who actually is in is in jail right now. So it, it, he was one of our friends when we went to high school. So people take these different. You know, when you're young, it seems like your life is gonna go on like that forever everything's going to be great and then when you get to my age you realize that what the hell happened you know it, it weren't we supposed to be like you know um presidents and you yeah. know in congress and 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 what have you you know big right. ass lawyers you know I, but life doesn't turn out like that and and at the end of the lunch my my friend said to me that that you know that I haven't changed. Obviously, I have changed, but he felt that I haven't changed because I was making music when I went to high school, and I'm still making music. But obviously, that that was a long time ago. And had we had more time, because you know we had been eating lunch already at that point for three hours, and the wives were starting to call. It's like you know who's going to pick up the kids from the soccer practice. So we had to, you know, it's like we got to go. But yeah. um, you know, but that's what the song is about: how we change, how we evolve, how we grow. Sometimes we get lucky and life takes us this way. Sometimes we get unlucky and life takes us that way. And that's really what the song is about. And obviously me saying that I still love life. I still love music. I still love the same things as I did when I was 16 or 17. I haven't really changed all that much, but obviously I'd like to think that I'm a bit more mature than I was when I was 16, you know. Well, I will tell you that from my perspective, you're I still a young like man. the Beatles, man. Oh well, yeah. Huh? I'm still, you know, it's like somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle there, you know. Exactly. This is this is Tom Tika, and the name of the song is "Hearts on Fire." I put this together myself. I hope you like it.
And that is Tom Tika, and the song is Hearts on Fire. I submit to you, young man, that that is a song that you could not have written when you were 16 years old because you didn't have the life experience to do it. And that is a that, that is a great piece right there. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. It and, was. And, uh, I, I loved the. Uh, I loved the pictures. I hadn't seen them for a while, and and. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed that a, a lot. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad because um, uh, Michael Stover, he puts together some real good press releases for you guys. And so it gives me an opportunity to learn more about you and stuff like that. So it worked out. It worked out really quite nicely. And so I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it was also nice to see the, the single cover. I, I, you know, I hadn't forgotten, but I, 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 you know, it has my boys in it. It's my, those, those are my three kids in the yeah. cover. Yeah, oh, cool. and uh, yeah. yeah, it was actually Michael's idea to get my kids involved and you know have the soccer ball there and and um, which, which I thought was a great idea. So, yeah, it was. And by the way, I love the drumming on that. So, <laughs> oh, thanks, man. thanks. Yeah. I, I know you did all that. Good. Yeah, you gave it my all, man. Yeah, you did all the instruments yourself, and it 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 came out really. How did now? I have never, I tried drumming. I tried learning how to do that and I can't get my hands and my feet to move independently. How did you learn to do that? You know, that's the thing with, I, it, I started that when I was so young that I don't, I, I, I remember that it was a long process to get to the point where you can actually play something and it's good enough that the, you, you know, you, that you can record it. But uh, my my sons actually asked me about that, and they also asked me like, how what was it like to learn the guitar? But I was so young, like six, you know. It, it's um, I remember picking up the guitar, and I remember um, <clears throat> uh, my my uncle showing me the chords, and and um, and I think that the person who taught me how to drum a little bit was was the guy next door who played in my first band he was a drummer uh called Mikael Mikaela and, and I think that he was he was the guy who sort of showed me the ABCs you know the ropes and and, and but it, it was all such a long time ago that that it's weird because I remember the process when I was getting a little bit you know a, a bit better and then I realized that I gotta practice even more and I remember that arduous process, but I can't, you know, as to how it all came together, especially with the guitar. I have no idea. It's almost like I always played, you know, which I didn't. I mean, nobody, nobody's born with a guitar. And well, it's, you, it's, you, you know, close. but learning, <laughs> yeah, close. Learning the drums is basically trial and error in the studio, realizing that. And, I, you know, I still fix the tracks. I, I have to, uh, I, you know, it's, there are parts that, I play real well and then there are parts where I have to sequence it a little bit to you know get it where I want it to be. So once again, but yeah, I know enough that I can, you know, work with that. And I love the, I love the tune and I love the lyrics. It's it, it's a it's a great song. It's it's I think it's going to do yeah. very, very well. I think it's well, going to do very so. well. It is one of my better ones, I think. And 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 um I'm I'm very I'm very pleased with the way it turned out. And and um you know Got to ask you because I it's because songwriting to me it's a mystery. I I think it the it it must just come like like come into your head and then there it is. But how, for you, how does it work? Well, you know, it's it's weird. I I write I write one song every day, and um, I record them. I I record acoustic demos of them, and then I go back to those demos maybe three months later. You know, so right now I'm listening to songs actually that I. I wrote in January 
and um and so i'm a bit behind <laughs> michael's working me to the bone <laughs> sorry michael you're not just kidding um but i'm a bit behind but, but i think you need that objectivity that the distance from the track that you can actually decide if it's any good because lots of times you know if you start working on a song too quickly um you figure out a year later that well you know it wasn't really one of my best ones but here it is now and so i've given up um working on a song too quickly after i've written it so what i do is the process oh, oh can you still hear me yeah i'm back yes you you you, you were yeah, cutting it out just a little um, bit yeah so uh oh somebody doesn't like me talking about songwriting man. <laughs> right. um but anyway yeah so i go back to the acoustic demos uh oh what's going on i can still okay. i can still hear you okay good so i'll just keep yeah so what i'll do these days is i'll just go back to them a little bit later then i get the object objectivity and i can decide which one is actually good and which one isn't now let's get you, another question quickly <laughs> you know it's like well, I, I gotta follow up on that because you're telling me you write over 300 songs a year yeah i do i do i do actually yeah it's true i um that's amazing yeah, i i that's what that's my dad you see well, you know, not all of them are good, though. That that's what my dad did. He always said that don't wait for don't wait for inspiration. You know, it's, you know, merchant marine, right? So don't don't well, wait for inspiration. Just you know, just write a song a day. And he always said that whoever starts waiting for inspiration is the guy who never finds it. And um, he always felt that I should approach songwriting like it's a job. And 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 he's in a way he's right. And so that's what I always did. I just kind of. Um, started doing that every day i picked up pick up the guitar and and whatever it is that i'm feeling i just kind of put it in put it into in, write a melody you know based on that and then record that it's not a very you know lengthy process and my head's always been filled with melodies anyway and so you know it takes about 30 minutes to get something going and sometimes i know at the end of the 30 minutes that i'll never record this song but here it is here's my contribution for you know the 24th of june 2021 right but okay. um then every once in a while you get this sense that oh man this this is really good you know and then when you come back to it you kind of hone it a little bit you know i usually don't write middle eights when you know, i just write the verse and the chorus you know just these basic building blocks and then if they sound great still after a couple of months then i'll return to them and finish them but obviously not everything gets recorded, you know, because you know if it's three hundred sixty-five songs a year, so it's well, you've just been, the best ones. You've been doing this a long time, and you also have been, been performing live for a long time. What I, I wanted to ask: What's it like for the band when you guys have a, a thousand people in the audience or two thousand people in the audience, and then you're walking up onto the stage? It must be a real rush. It must it must be a real high. Oh, it's scary as hell. You know, and 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 um, and because you never know how it's gonna go, and and you always have it in your head that maybe my voice is gonna fail me. Maybe tonight's the night, you know. And um, I mean, you can never really control it. That's part of the charm. And I think that once you get through that first song, it'll all be good. But you know, you don't even need to. The funny part is that you don't even need the ten thousand people in the audience, because you know, with COVID, I started doing these live gigs, right? and uh on camera right like this just playing here which is weird because you don't get that interaction so right you know you got to bring your best moves to the table without no without anybody rooting you on right <laughs> and 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 the only people you just see your own stupid face you know just if you're looking at the camera it's like can you do it you know and i'm like what the heck? but even that you know even if you're in the comfort of your own home um it's still scary Oh, I, I, I can imagine. I can only imagine because it's 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 like being on stage and as an actor or whatever. Because there's so many variables involved, you don't know what's about to happen, and if somebody screws up and and stuff. So, but uh, it, it but uh, once I'm, you get the first one out of the way, and the, and you know, especially if you're live and people reacting to it positively, then you're kind of like, oh man, you know. 
<laughs> so what's the, what's the future hold for you? Are you going to be a uh, single artist? Are you going to join a band again? What are you going to do? Well, the impersonators are a duo, but I mean, you know, it, it's so, you know, that'll, that'll keep going. And then there's Tom Tick and the missing hopcaps. I think those are the two projects that I'll keep working, working on. Um, I, you know, it, it took forever to get Carmen Gray off the ground. It took even longer to get the impersonators off the ground and Tom Tick and the missing hopcaps, you know, it, it, it's actually, you know, I've built it on the back of Carmen Gray and the impersonators. There won't be a fourth one. These are the, these are the projects that, uh, that I'm going to be involved with and um, uh, to, you know, until the unforeseeable future. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see myself becoming just Tom Tika um, or joining another band. You know, I, I think that yeah, might be still a young man, but uh, you know, depending on who's looking at me, depends on totally on that. But, but, you know, I, uh, to start a band, I've done it done a couple of times and, and it's great but it's also a lot of work as a solo artist especially if you play everything yourself um you get exactly what you want and i think that even though not old i'm i'm at an age where i want things the way i want them and and touring especially when you got kids touring ah, can be really hard <laughs> no i mean it's that's you know you want to once you're a certain age, you have kids and you're married, you kind of want to stay off the road because that's where all the stupid shit gets done, you know. I, 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 I think that also if you spend a lot of time away from home, you really don't know where home is anymore. Right. And and who really wants that anymore? You know, I got a I got a three four year old and a six year old sleeping downstairs, you know. I want to spend time with them. I don't want to eat mints off pillows at hotels that you know, I've seen too many of them anyway. Yeah, I, I I used to travel for a living, so I I know exactly what you're saying. But yeah, it's it, a lonely existence. It it really is, especially when you know you've got uh, preteens. Wait till they become teenage boys, then you're gonna want to be around all the time. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or maybe maybe the opposite happens. You want to get back on the road. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> nah, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, so uh, anyway, we've got another song that we're going to play, but I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm, why don't we, uh, uh, we can go ahead and wrap it up? And because it's 1130 your time and you've got people that are up that are probably wanting to go to bed and they can, they can't while you're doing this and stuff. So so I first of all, I want to give you the opportunity to talk to our audience and tell them anything that you'd like them to know from uh, your life experience, from who you are, uh, any anything that you'd like them to know. Well, I mean, in terms of who I am, I'm just a guy who likes music, enjoys music, and be very fortunate to be able to record and make it, release it. Um, but if there's anything that I want, truly want to say is, is that uh, cherish life. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I've made very many bad choices. So I've learned the hard way. And um, what I've learned is that don't spend time, uh, you know, on relationships that don't work don't spend time working at it you know working a job you hate um it all goes by so fast i was visiting my dad's grave the other day and uh um it just you know i i wish i had spent even more time with him as a, a, as an adult i think that one of the things we fail to understand when we're a bit younger is that it will all come to an end and if you put your time towards something that isn't ultimately going to make you happy. What do you got at the end of the day? Nothing. So, you know, I want to quote Abe Lincoln. It's not the years in your life that count, but life in your years. And I think that's the best quote ever because, you know, um, it's so very true. Whether it is, you know, whether you're a songwriter, a garbage man, a pilot, you know, um, CEO, CFO, none of these things really matter because at the end of the day, we're just people that, who are either happy or unhappy. And I think that, you know, if, if there's anything that I've learned is that, you know, if you have a choice, which lots of times we do in the Western world, we're very fortunate, um, choose to be happy, you know, uh, just get rid of stuff that makes you unhappy. Enjoy the days you have left. Hopefully they're plentiful. And um, just keep changing when something isn't exactly right for you. 
you know, just toss it out the window, find something that is. That's the message I want to leave. That's what Hearts on Fire is ultimately about, you know. And that's where I am at right now. Figuring out that, you know, I've had an incredibly cool life, great life. But I, number one, I could have been a better man and I could have made better choices. But from now on, I'll try to just do that, you know, live smarter, you know. Can I tell you that you are a really cool dude? I have to tell you. Hey, Matt, thanks. thanks. <laughs> I Matt. love I love the message. And you're you're absolutely right. Is you gotta live your passion and you have to live with passion every day. And that's that that will make you a happy guy. And it also is a great example for your kids. Hey, thanks. That's you know, that's awfully kind of you to say that, man. I appreciate that. Well, you you know you've gone you've been through the wars. You came out the other side. You've got you're still got music in your heart. You got a beautiful wife, couple of kids. Life is good, and you and you deserve it. You really do. Thanks, thanks. Life is good. Yes, indeed. So we're gonna play uh, um, on our way out. We're gonna play uh, working class voodoo. Do you want to set that up for us before we go? It's a phrase that my granddad used. He was uh, sort of a you know he was uh, nobility. He was he he was a nobleman and um, married married just a working class girl and got ostracized for that. But he kind of always had this notion of working. My dad's very dad was very blue collar, extremely, but he always had this notion of working class complaining but not doing anything about it. You know, which isn't exactly true, but that was his view, and I don't really endorse that view. But that emancipation he used to call working class voodoo. You know, it's like sticking needles into dolls, but not really doing actively anything to change. It's bad mouthing, you know, politicians, yeah. they, politicians that, decision makers, this, decision makers that, just getting drunk and complaining. And he always, that, that, that was his, you know, definition of working class voodoo. And hence the song. That's sort of an, you know, um, um, to honor my granddad's memory. We've been talking with Tom Tika. And uh, when the album comes out in the fall, will you come back? I definitely will. If you'll, if you have me back, I'll, I'll be back on the show. I've enjoyed this tremendously. Oh, absolutely. You, you, you are a talented guy who has uh, refined his talent. And not only that, you appreciate it. And you've also looked at great ways to help other people through your lyrics and through what you're talking about to uplift their lives. Um, and that, that is, there, there are people in the world, Tom, that you don't know who you're going to impact. And some of them are going to be positively impacted. And, it's, and sometimes your music is going to change someone's life. I can't think of a better vocation. Nicely put, man. I really hope that that's, that's the case. And I'll tell you, if you'll have me back on the show in the fall when the album comes out, I'll tell you what camel milk tastes like. <laughs> oh, God. One of my, one of my best adventures uh, from when I was uh, 21. But that'll have to wait until the fall. It's kind of a cliffhanger here going. You know? yeah, absolutely. Camel milk, really? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we Again, we've been talking with uh, Tom Tika, and I, uh, he's got a brand new uh, uh, EP out, which is um, uh, Hearts on Fire. Go to Spotify. Please buy the music. Don't steal it. Don't. Uh, upload it uh, against the law. Um, it's, he worked hard for this, and he deserves to be paid for it. So make sure that you do it properly and that you buy it from a reputable source and uh, tell your friends about it and so they could buy it as well. If they wanted to pick up any of your any of your work, any of your albums, can they uh, work, Can they get a, Amazon? Is it all there? Uh, it's on all, yeah, in Amazon, all streaming platforms, all everywhere. And if you want to know about my comings and goings, what's new, what's happening, you can go to www.tomtika.com. It's all there. Very good. And that's T I K K A uh, dot com. Correct. Yes. So that's, that's awesome. Go say hello to your wife and your lovely family and say thank you on my behalf for, for uh, you staying up so late and doing this. I will do, man. Yeah. yeah, this was great, though. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, you betcha. So with that, we are going to play Working Man or Working Class Voodoo, and then we're going to close it out. And uh, so I release you, sir, to, to the debauchery of the night. <laughs> All right. Cheers, man. <laughs> Take care. I'll Thank leave you. the studio now. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Good evening. 
Tomorrow's weather will be much the same as it was today. Rainy and cloudy. I guess Mona Lisa smiles. I've never been too rude. Wasted all my precious time on dreams just like you. My phoenix from the flames died this afternoon. My job, still got my greasy spoon. I might have left my roots, yet I'm no Danny Boone. Heroes come and go, they end up in cartoons. Just a little rain, nothing else will do. I know it sounds insane. And thanks for listening to this episode all the way to the end. Hey, pretty cool. Hey, don't forget to follow us so you can receive regular updates and new posts. And remember, take care of each other because each other's all we've got. See you next time on My Independence Report.